And we're back. What's happening, everybody? This is Into Deep, and I am Jack Rowland. First episode of the year, back from a little hiatus. And this is episode 100. Woohoo! Thank you all so much for tuning in and uh, and listening to this little show. I really, really appreciate it. And if any of you guys would like to support the show, I have just started a little Patreon. Uh, just look for Into Deep Podcast. But above all else, um, spread the word. If you like it, if you've got a favorite episode, please tell a friend because I would love to see this show grow. If any of you have listened to any of my previous episodes, uh, themed around QAnon, you definitely would have heard me talk about Jim Watkins at some point. Who is my guest today? Jim Watkins is a businessman and the current owner of the image board website 8kun, formerly called 8chan. The website functions as a forum for a wide variety of subjects where the users can post and interact completely anonymously. It's a bit of a platform for free speech absolutists. If the content isn't illegal, it will be tolerated, no matter how intolerable the content gets. The website has had a controversial history. One, HN had a lot of negative attention as it was the platform that a number of violent extremists used to post their manifestos before acting out mass shootings. And two, it became the exclusive platform for the mysterious and anonymous figure known as Q, whose Q drop sparked off a big strange conspiratorial pro-Trump movement that us normies call QAnon. Jim featured as one of the central characters in the HBO documentary series Q Into the Storm, a six-part series outlining the story of QAnon and attempts to figure out who Q might be. The show heavily implies that Q is Jim's son, Ron. However, it remains a speculation and not proven. I'll be honest with you guys, the audio on this episode is pretty fucking shit. Unfortunately, there was really not much I could do about it. Jim was a little hard to pin down, Um, I had a couple of appointments to chat with him that fell through. Then a few days later, I just got a call from him out of the blue at 7.30 in the morning while he was driving across Nevada. It's a bit of a challenging listen, so for that, I'm sorry. But it is what it is. Um, It's all there. I hope you guys stick with it. Enjoy my chat with Jim Watkins. Is there a point to all this? I think we're getting in too deep. You don't apply. Bad luck. Oh, I have one speed. I have one gear. Go, 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 go. I'll tell you when we're getting into deep, 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 deep. Can you hear me? Okay. Is, is this going to be all right while I'm driving? Yeah, I think I think that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Hey, so um, when I first reached out to you, you told me that you were at the um, the Arizona Trump rally. I was wondering how that went. That, that was a lot of fun. I had a great time and I met some really wonderful people there. Uh, I, I am so glad that I attended. Uh, I was a little bit surprised uh, by the the media's reception to it. I, I know I Afterwards, I, 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 the Rolling Stones wrote about me being there, and I, there were like two paragraphs about him and my son Ron in in their article. And then they wrote nothing nice, of course, but at least it's writing about us. You get I had to get into Rolling Stones, but what surprised me was they were talking about the uh, attendance. Rolling Stones had like the attendance at one five thousand, fifteen thousand. Mm-hmm. But uh, they announced the official attendance at the event at fifty five thousand. Right. What 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 kind of numbers do you estimate they were? I'm well. I'm I'm going to go with the fifty five thousand because it was like a enough people there to fill a professional stadium, a you know sports stadium for sure. So it, it was, a, you know, it was a huge amount of people and it took a couple hours to get out of the parking lot. So it definitely was not a, like a little, little college basketball game worth of people. Right. What, what did, um, what did Rolling and, Stone say about you? I don't even recall. Mm-hmm. Some, some 
probably that I needed to comb my hair or some, some, <laughs> so they had nothing nice to say. <laughs> you know, they're not they're not a respectable magazine. If they, they used to be you know, something you'd want to be involved with, but not anymore. Hmm. So what's the what's the overall kind of vibe at these Trump rallies? You know, it's uh, 2022 now. The it's a, it, I can feel like there's hope for our country. Right. And, and that, that's, that's the important thing. Um, it's like, you know, God, God walked away from Sodom and Gomorrah because they couldn't find anybody worth saving. Hmm. But I don't think he's going to walk away from our country because there are still plenty of people who are saving in the United States of America. And we are the last stand for liberty and freedom in the world. All the other countries seem to be falling down and, and just bending over to the, uh, to the people that want to just rule the entire world. Hmm. What what exactly about Donald Trump gives gives you and I guess so many people so many people in the country hope? Well, Donald Trump is a is a businessman and he's a he's a leader. He's not just a manager; he's a leader. He knows how to get people motivated to get something done. And, he, and he's not all about red tape. So he can, he can cut through the layers of government garbage to get the important things done. Right. Do you think, do you think, Whereas, um, yeah, look, at, look, at what, look at what we have now in comparison. Why, why do you think so many, why do you think Donald Trump is so polarizing from your perspective as a, as a supporter, as someone who's, I guess, been on, Board since no, Donald Trump is not polarizing. But you're you're mistaken in your in your even suggesting that he's a uh, not a polarizing influence. The majority of America really likes Donald Trump. Now, what what he has done is he has gone against the narrative that the the oligarchs of America and, and the rest of the world. Want, want people to follow, and he's decided that we can we can do something better. We don't have to be second class servants and slaves to the oligarchs, and and people see that in him. They see the opportunity to improve instead of the the chance to cannibalize something and and take it apart, and get a quick profit. Something like like a hedge fund manager might do with a business. Donald Trump looks at America like it's a business, and where he can build on it and find a way to industrialize it better and to improve the output of the country to the benefit of all of the citizens inside it. That that's where the difference between you know Donald Trump and the people that run Joe Biden. The people that run Joe Biden are are running America like it's a hedge fund and liquidating. They are liquidating our country, and, and that's at the by lying to us. They're they're committing crimes to do it, and and they're doing it fast enough that they can't uh, be tried for it, and they're trying to do it big enough that they can train the political climate of the country permanently to the point that they'll never get prosecuted for the crimes they've committed. The biggest crimes um, being... Could, could you repeat that? You oh, sorry. I was just saying, um, <clears throat> what, what would be the kind of the main crimes that you're referring to? From the Biden administration, and I guess. Well, the... how about how about the, the surrendering of Afghanistan, leaving the equipment behind, and leaving the American people in Afghanistan, <laughs> and just walking away? 
that's an un-American way to do things. How do you think that's, Trump would have handled it? Against, I think that he would have, you know, he had already agreed to leave the country. I think that he would have left the country and kept enough people there to have a decent uh, withdrawal, decent in you know, order, instead of people falling off of airplanes, the wrong people getting on airplanes, child brides being smuggled on those airplanes. These are crimes. These are big crimes. And, uh, Blinken, you know, Blinken, Blinken, and not Blinken, the he even he has even admitted to a handful of child brides getting through. So what is a handful? A handful is like six. So at least sixty child brides were smuggled on on U.S. Air Force uh, planes, and one is too many. Yeah, sixty certainly certainly someone should go to jail for that. Right. So do you think that's just a failure of vetting who was coming on and, and that kind of and stuff? Then, and then leaving leaving the Americans behind in Afghanistan, it makes me wonder if he wasn't uh, leaving them behind on purpose to cover up something and then expect them to become disappeared. It's, I, there's, no, there's no trust at all with him and the rest of our country. Nobody trusts him. They all... The majority of our country knows that he has been placed there and not actually elected there. So, do you what 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 is the kind of the current state of America and American politics as you see it? What what's what's the biggest kind of risk? That's a pretty broad question. Well, I guess what what's the what's the biggest kind of um threat that um that I suppose um troubles you? by having the Democrats in power? I don't have a problem with Democrats or Republicans. I have a problem with the specific ones that are in power have gotten there illegal. Right, right. I don't, I'm not a, I'm not a, a staunch any side there. It's not, if, if they were elected properly and, and were there to represent our republic, then that would be okay with but not a one of them is even willing to call our country a republic. Mm. Yeah, okay. That's a big problem because we have a republic if we keep it. And that's, that's how we fit. They are trying to turn it into a law rule where just a few cities run the entire United States of America, which is the cities keeping the rest of the population as a uh, servants to support them because the cities can't survive on their own without the rest of the nation. That's why we have a republic so that it can be delegated out so that not just the cities have the only say mm. in what's going on in the country. So, I guess... Other, otherwise, you know, uh, New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles run the United States. Nobody else has a mm. say. So why why exactly do you? I know Donald Trump has not been, you know, he hasn't been a career politician by any means. He's an outsider. I can completely see why that's appealing. Um, but you know, he's also kind of um, he's, he's also, also successful. Uh, sure, sure. He's a successful man, and and people are attracted to success. And he made our country successful. Everybody was doing better until COVID. Mm. Our whole country, a lot of the world, was doing better until COVID. I guess um, what I was kind of uh, leaning towards is, is there any, you know, he... Although he's a very successful businessman, he's not a career politician, you could almost argue that Donald Trump is one of, you know, kind of he's rubbed shoulders with elites his whole time. Um, uh, you know, Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. I, I, I don't. 
Sorry, yeah, absolutely. I guess I was just saying... I didn't hear that sentence. uh, Donald Trump, although he's an outsider, although he's not a career politician, he has also um, rubbed shoulders with elites the whole time. He has, uh, you know, had people from Goldman Sachs in his kind of administration. Is there there kind of any suspicion or anything that he is, uh, you know, I guess still has interests with the wrong people? the elites, big business, rather than the fellow man, etc.? Well, I think that that's a buzzword, the elites. You know, he's been successful from from young man until adult, and he turned himself into, you know, one of the few billionaires on the world, and billionaires can be considered the elites. That's where, I guess, you would draw the line. Yeah. But but he's certainly, he's certainly not accepted in the uh, billionaire boys club. Otherwise, he would be doing better, right? Instead, he's uh, losing money. He's lost a lot of his fortune to, uh, to do his best for the United States of America. It's like he volunteered for three years, you know? I I know that you and Ron have been um, very vocal uh, voices about the uh, the 2020 election uh, being fraudulent and stolen. Um, I'm wondering if we could go back, you know, it's it's January now, January 6th, anniversary of January 6th has just kind of passed, a year since, um, I guess... Uh, we still have people in jail for that. Yeah. We yeah. still have people that have not been to court that there's still a, a pretrial confinement in 19th century prison conditions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You were there on the day of January 6. I'm wondering if you could kind of give me your impressions of the day from your perspective, someone that was there in, in, um, in protest of the results of the election and, and in support of Donald Trump. Well, I was there for the... The speech, and I stood over by the Washington Monument most of the morning. Right. Then after the speech, we walked over to the the Capitol, and there were millions of people there. Unbelievable amount of people. Probably the most people that have ever been in Washington D.C. at one time. It was a huge amount of people. I'm going to estimate it at three million people from the photographs I've seen of it from being on the ground and seeing all of the avenues that go to the Capitol were full of people. So, and when you got to the Capitol, there was no violence going on. We just stopped there and everyone just hung out and we were there peacefully. They could see that. Now, from what I gather, the people there, they arrested like 650 people. They, they had gone into the Capitol from the other side, not the side towards the Washington Monument. So what, what struck me the most about the crowd is the cleanliness. Hmm. You know, there was uh, no trash litter. There was, it was clean. I've, I've been to Washington, D.C. many times, and it's usually dirty. Mm-hmm. But they, this were these were people trying to be at their most respectful, right? And right. it was it was a it was a real cross section of America. One percent of the United States was there then. Wow! And I don't think that's ever been done. We're talking about Martin Luther King Jr.'s march on Washington in 1963, in August of 1963 didn't have as many people as this. It was, it was huge. And it was a real cross-section. It was all races, all religions. It was, it Ooh, sorry, Jim. It's a bit hard to, it's a bit hard to hear you right now. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm in the Sierras, so, you know, things happen. Yeah, Hopefully sure. it'll come through okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was... Uh, it was a lot of people there, and it was a cross section of America. You felt like you were there with America. That people had flags from different places they were from. It, 
was a a nice day. Hmm. It was cold, and and then the mayor Bowser had called martial law later on in the day. Everyone had to leave. Do you do you so think at that, that time we we all left? Right. So what what are your impressions of the people that did enter? the Capitol building and, um, you know, destroyed property, went into Nancy Pelosi's office, stole the podium, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Q Shaman, who was well, in there I, roaring. Well, I don't think the Q Shaman stole anything. Did he? No, I don't think so. No. I've met him. He stole the show. He stole the show. Show. Okay, he stole the show. Okay. He stole the show. There you go. <laughs> um, it, well, the people that uh, stole things and stuff, I'm sure, will be prosecuted. There's plenty of people that are still in jail for trial confinement, presumed innocent until they're proven guilty. You know, that's America. Of course. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that if they broke something or stole something, they'll be uh, held accountable for that. It's just taking them quite a bit of time. They're, they're making the process the punishment. Hmm. From what what I've seen, the only person that committed a crime that would put you in jail for many many years is the uh, policeman that murdered the lady there. Right. You don't think everyone that he else, was? Everyone else. Everyone else was committing crimes that would not put you in jail. For them. And, and where 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 are you from? I'm from Australia. We've had some. Are you calling from Australia now, or? Yeah, yeah, calling from Australia. Yep. Okay. So, do you have do you have counties there, or do you have? Uh, uh, states, states. Uh, we, yeah. What, what do you call your your precincts or counties? Or? We, but yeah, pretty much in states. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, you got a state like and in suburbs like, uh, in the states. New South Wales, or that's right, or something yep. like that, right? Yep, yep, yep. So. In your state, then it's broken up into smaller areas, and yeah, then you would have probably a, a policeman or a constable or somebody like that. Mm -hmm. If you had uh, been arrested in New South Wales, or and I'm not talking about these days, because what I've seen out of Australia, whether it's true or not, is is something else. But I, it hasn't looked pretty for Australian police. Yeah, but it's, normally, it's been an ordeal. I don't think there's anything. I don't think there's anything that would have put you in jail for more than a weekend and maybe doing some community service, picking up garbage or something for a couple of weeks after that for most of these guys. Mm -hmm. that, that's just that's just my thinking. If, if that had happened in, in my hometown, that's what would happen. If they, that, you know, they would probably go to jail for the weekend and right. then do community service. Because no, there was no violence happening. Now, if you talk 650 people out of 3 million, we're talking like, what's that, a two hundredths of a percent? That's that's a tiny amount of people. You know, that on a, on a graph, that's not even going to be graph unless you make it a logarithmic graph. So, yeah, Realistically, a city of 3 million people has more people in jail day to day than the 650 that were arrested that day. Right. So it's, it's a nothing burger. It's, a, it's an excuse for for a witch hunt and show trials because it's the communists trying to take over our country, just like they're trying to take over Australia and New Zealand as well. And the politicians are all in because, you know, they're, they're either bribed or or blackmailed, and they won't uh, they won't give in without a fight because if they give up after they've been bribed or blackmailed, and the and the guys come in and win, then they'll be the ones in prison. They'll be the ones hanging for for committing crimes against the state. It, it's a it's a terrible position for them to be in, and both sides are now being backed against the wall because the politicians are not given in because they're caught. And no king in the past has ever just given up and said, I'm not going to fight. He 
because I don't want to be king anymore. No, they start a war. That's what these guys are going to do. And the people have their back against the wall because they either have to submit to the tyranny and give up their country and the liberty and freedom that they've grown up with, or they have to fight. And we're being pushed towards that rapidly. I'd say we have a year or less left unless one died or the other gives in. This um this kind of communist agenda um is you know it's really at the forefront of I guess the resistance to uh, a lot of these COVID restrictions. Uh, what's happened, like you mentioned, what's happening in Australia and New Zealand, what's happening in America. So where it's, where do you think it's this? It's not just New Zealand and Australia too. It's most of the English. It's most of the English speaking countries. Right. Where- and and most of Europe included. Right. So you have you have the Philippines, you have you have Australia, you have New Zealand that are English speaking countries that area. Hong Kong's already been put there under the boot of the government already there. So what about Singapore? I don't know what's going on in Singapore. They've been pretty quiet. But there's not much else left, is there? Um, yeah, I'm. I'm not sure. Where Where do you, you think know, this? And cer- certainly, the Five Eyes, of, you know, the spy network of our country, your country, and our country, and a few other countries. Is this a uh, a safe safe system anymore with a uh, communist China inside your government? Well, that's and you getting our nuclear submarines. And, and the communist Chinese are inside your government now. So that that was going to be my question. Safe. Where is this communist push um, coming from? You believe China? China. China. So why why does China have such a stronghold yeah. on all of these um, Western the West? Why do you think they have? Why do you think the West is uh, uh, doing allowing? Where do you think our where do you think our labor has been outsourced to? China. Yeah, Chinese slave labor has been, been putting our stuff together in the United States. And we've been living off of our income from intellectual property, which they've stolen as well, which leaves us just our agriculture and raw materials available like Australia. And they're after that as well. They're buying up our farmland. Our mineral rights and our ports. So we're, we're stuck in a bad position because of that. And if, if this is true that all these um, politicians are just kind of bending over backwards towards this, why, why do you do you think that there's been, I guess, a concerted global effort to put in politicians that are aligned with these communist ideas or are they weak? What What's going on globally? What's the big picture? Well, as I said, they're, they're either blackmailed or bribed. Right. Or and at this point, they realize that the slow speed of justice has moved traditionally through every part of history is is on their side. They can commit the crimes fast, but they can't be tried fast, and they're using that now against the rest of the United States and the rest of the world. You know, we can we can go in and and they're running economic, political, and societal split screens, fast, fast, fast attacks that justice can't keep up with. Justice will eventually catch up if they lose. But they have one more year in the United States. They can have power permanently forever. If this next election in the United States is not conducted fairly, then the U.S. is over as a country, and it may stay as the United States of America, but it will only be a people thing. Our Constitution will no longer be honored. Why? Why do you think that? And, and, 
the why do you think that the left in general is more compliant with this than the right and and even um not just the politicians um the general leftist supporter the the never trumpers I don't think the general, uh, I don't, sir i don't think the general elect is left wing I think that the majority of America is moderate curve on, on being just normal people. The left both politically minorities, but they're aggressive and they're noisy. And the political majority hovers around the middle, you know, leaning a little bit liberal or conservative, but mostly in the middle. With the you know the biggest argument is are you union or are you not union things like that or what church do you go to you know, which people will argue about but they don't generally shoot each other over <laughs> hmm. you know that that's a that's the type of thing that's going on here right. Well, why why do you think why do you think there's such a resistance from the left of this kind of narrative? Why do you think people just don't believe the, the communist well, the, agenda? The left is the left. Well, the left has always wanted to be communist, aren't they? The communists, that's what they are. Well, that's the extreme so left. So, of course, that's they the, want, they want, yeah. That, but, well, that's the extreme is in power. But, you know, I mean, I, don't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that all right wingers or the right wing in general wants to be what's the other. A fascist, I guess. I, w- I wouldn't. I wouldn't categorize the right like that. There's very moderate uh, right wing politicians, left wing politicians. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that the well, left wants to be communist. This is, this is where you. No, right and the left are both uh, political minorities. Where what you are doing is you're combining conservatives and liberals with left and right. Can't be. Can't be. Because they're a great big clump on a on a graph. Was the center of the paper? Did you graph it out? The the left and the right are noisy political. All the money is on the on the side of the left right now, and that's that's because the big corporations in the United States have have gone directly over to the Communist Party, and they're they're collecting nation state money to stay open and to provide the services that they provide because and the right wing is, you know, they try to break into that, but the infrastructure is not there for them because the infrastructure is all owned by left wing and communist finance countries. Right. There's no possible way Google, for example, can do what Google does without government support. Hmm. And that's both the government of China and the government of the United States and several other governments that pay them money to do what they do because it costs them more to do what they do than they would ever make in advertising. So is the political landscape, I guess, now a battle, um, particularly from the pro-Trump crowd, a battle between good and evil? Is, is, is that kind of why it's become such a yes, boy yeah. point? I wouldn't even say it was just a pro-Trump crowd. I would say it was more about it's like last chance or we're, or we're going to be like a, I see this as the beginning of the cultural revolution in the United States and our history will be destroyed just like the Chinese history was. Right, right. So when it comes to the uh, 2020 election, um, I'm assuming Dominion is kind of a, a large corporation that's been compromised. Is that kind of what's going on? Is there a direct cahoots with the Democratic Party? Is it big business? What, what do you believe is well, driving I that? Well, I think Dominion is a, Dominion's a multinational corporation, mm-hmm. originally from Venezuela. And their main headquarters here in North America is Ontario, Canada. And the United States has rules and laws against doing business with companies like this, but they're doing it anyway. Now, as far as their their machines, I, I know my 
my son, Ron Watkins, wrote a white paper on how it was possible to to cheat with those machines. And he didn't say they were cheating, but he showed people how it was possible to do it. And right. obviously they were not happy with that because people actually did it. And it turned out that that's the way things happen. But so- he didn't actually... He didn't actually say that Dominion cheated it. He said that he showed how they could do it. Right, right. So, I mean, look, I, I'm, I don't know the nitty-gritty uh, details in the election fraud um, narrative, but uh, how, how where, I guess, why, why has there been... Is there proof, I guess, is my question. Mike Lindell, for example, the MyPillow guy, has been uh, extremely vocal. He's he's, um, started his frank speech. He's, uh, uh, I can't remember the name of that large event that he did that Ron spoke at, but he's been very vocal about having proof for the election fraud. But but the the date has constantly shifted. What's happened with Mike Lindell's proof uh, and why has it... Well, I've... I've never met Mike Lindell, hmm. and you know I have a couple of uh, pillows with this company. How are they? But uh, but I've never I've never advertised for him. I've never met him. I yep. you know Ron has met him a couple times, and of course he did the speaking at the thing. But uh, I don't know the details on that. I know, of course, that. He, He's made a movie saying he's got what, what's the movie called? Definitive Proof or something like that. Mm-hmm. But I but I haven't actually taken the time to watch it. So I don't know too much in details. I've just seen the summary. So do you believe there is proof that the election was fraudulent? I I've seen enough proof for me, but it's but it doesn't matter what I've seen and it doesn't matter what Maybe you've seen it matters if a judge is willing to see it. And if the judge is willing to see it, is that judge corrupt or not? Because it's, you know, we've, we've had to the point where we can't even trust our judicial system to, to see something through appropriately. Are there any conditions? When, when all when all, I would say that a large majority of all three branches of the United States government are in a, in a bad position right now. Mm. Trump's put a fair few kind of um, more Republican um, judges in the Supreme Court, right? I, I think uh, he, he got a, a lady in there right before he left office, but I wouldn't know if she was a... Judges are not particularly into saying I'm Republican or Democrat. They're usually mm. non, uh, non-political king. Right. And uh, now who he got in there, I, I don't know if that was the best one that he could get in there, but, you know, she's in there. Are there any conditions that would um, would allow, would lead, lead you to believe that it wasn't stolen? I mean, it's possible that it wasn't stolen, right? Uh, no, it's not possible it wasn't stolen. It was stolen, and that's been proven. It just hasn't been proven in a court of law. But there's been enough evidence that has been publicly circulating, not on uh, mainstream media, but but on all of the alternate media like we're talking about right now. There's mm. obviously enough evidence and circumstances on Telegram to, to prove that the election was was cheated. But that evidence doesn't show up on a CNN or MSNBC or Fox or BBC or, you know, it just doesn't show up there. I mean, if the evidence is strong enough, though, I mean, there are other platforms, surely, that are large. No, no. It's a, how strong of evidence do you need when, when you have a 
forensic audit and criminal evidence turned into a attorney general that is supposed to take action with that that decides that he's going to investigate it. What is it? What kind of investigation is he going to do? Is he going to run another forensic audit? I mean, how much more evidence do you need? Yeah, I guess I don't know the extent of the evidence, really. Yeah, yeah, th- there you go. And 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 he's uh, running for Senate, and he's not going to overturn the apple cart. Hmm. Do you think that there's who who, if Donald Trump does not run, who's in politics now that you think? I mean. And and even is there anyone on the left that you think inspires any hope at all, or or if not, who who in politics well, do you think could could you know represent these concerns? Well, that's a that's a pretty broad brush question. You know, I'm I'm uh, I'm willing to see you know what would be an interesting race to me would be, say, Mike Pompeo running for president with, say, uh, General Flynn or uh, even even uh, Lynn Wood as a vice president candidate with them against, say, uh, who's that lady from Hawaii? She ran, but nobody uh, really talked about her. Tulsi Gabbard. Now, now she seems to have integrity. I don't agree with all of the politics, but I would not uh, step on her integrity. You know, I believe she's a lieutenant colonel in the National Guard right now. And anything above lieutenant colonel in the military is very political as well. But she's a lieutenant colonel, and that is a, that is a very respected rank in the United States. Hmm. A lot of um, a lot of old Bernie supporters ended up flipping toward Trump. Um, what do you think about Bernie Sanders? I, I know oh. <laughs> Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders. Bernie, he's an old man, and he'll won't live much longer. What about uh, his ideals? He's chaos is his ideal, <laughs> and he's and he seems to be helping with that. Right. Why do you think many um, people supported Bernie? Um, I, I think he's a bitter, he's a bitter old man. You know? mm. He's uh, pushing communism pretty hard there, and, but he's open about that at least, which is at least he's got a little integrity on it. Right, right. Well, I guess um, you know, I guess we'll see what happens in twenty twenty two and then twenty twenty four, because uh, at this rate, there's a well, good chance we'll see more Trump. Yugoslavia when we had Tito, it was pretty good, wasn't it? I don't know too much. About Tito, did you say? I don't know too much about him. Tito, remember when Yugoslavia ran T- was run by Tito? Um, I'm not, I'm it was not a, familiar. It was a pretty good country. They had some problems, but they kept it together. Right. Yet I have a feeling that what happened to Yugoslavia will happen to the United States if, if the 22 and 24 election don't go through if they don't go through without the amount of cheating we had last time, then we will end up balkanized like those countries that turn that we have now after Yugoslavia. Hmm. Um, Remember the Innsbruck Olympics? Mm-hmm. And, and I, I don't know, we had Sarajevo, Sarajevo. Sarajevo, they had the beautiful Olympics, the Winter Olympics there. That was Yugoslavia. Right. But it's never returned to that. No. So you're uh, kind of inferring that um, there could be a a split pretty much in America. There's blue versus yeah, the red America countries. Yeah, the balkanized and then, and then the Chinese will eat it up piece by piece and that will be the end of that if we don't get our country back this year. 
There's a lot of Republicans that have kind of uh, embraced the idea of, you know, America kind of breaking up into different um, factions, I guess. Do you think that's just... I'm, uh, it's a fight a lot. I think that you, well, yeah, you good point. You're going to find a lot of anybody. Americans and, and both the Democrats and Republicans are pretty much into state indivisible. <laughs> we'll argue over different things. When you're talking about a small number of right wing radicals that are that are more similar to their left wing opponents than to the majority of the United States. We're regular people. Yeah. yeah. We go and we drink Budweiser beer like you guys drink fosters and we <laughs> and we go to church on Sunday and we we go to football games and basketball games and we work really hard. And then we die. <laughs> you know, that's, that's Americans. Mm -hmm. We're not these wacko weirdos that want to, like, change everything up. So what, what, do you think, what do you think will be the, um, the bridging of the gap between these really opposing ideals between blue versus red, I guess, whether you call it. It's not, that's not, that is not the issue. There are not any really opposing ideas within the majority of the American people, is what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah, 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 no, what I'm, I'm not opposing are, that. What you have are narratives put up by the right-wing radicals and the left-wing radicals, and we're being told we have to choose the one that sucks the least. Right, right. Story and, of politics. And, you know, I was talking to a, a congressional candidate from Vermont the other day. He was saying, you know what? This is not about choosing who sucks the least. We need to choose the people that don't suck at all to run our country. Because they need to represent us. We can't run everything on consensus we have to run everything with representatives otherwise it doesn't work because it's too big yeah yeah it's the same like australia australia is federalized for that reason mm. it's not a national government in australia you're federal like the united states mm -hmm. so with a national but you're too big to be national a smaller country you know, maybe not uh, population-wise, but geographically can be nationalized and it's pretty much accepted and normal. But a big country, you know, are the people in Melbourne the same as the people in Perth? Uh, yeah, yeah, a few, a they, few minor differences. Well, I mean, they're the same. They, there's a few mild differences there. Hmm. And, but, but they have different uh, viewpoints and representatives and they pretty much run a different community yeah that's at the moment particularly yeah you know the distance is the reason for that so a centralized government is in the united states will turn us into a soviet type government where we have what standing in line and everything is run by the by the state nobody gives the a hoot if anything is uh made better or not because it isn't going to help them out personally and all they have is themselves to care about and it doesn't matter what what happens to anything else and before you know it, we have everyone living in apartment buildings with no windows and and huddled around garbage cans that are on fire for heat you know because no one's bothering to mine coal anymore or or dig an oil well because there's no money in it for them yeah yeah um a little um kind of change of direction um you know i i guess i first kind of got to know a bit of about you and ron through the documentary q into the storm i'm wondering i'm wondering what that kind of well, it was not my documentary. 
minutes for me. Oh, well, you're definitely one of the stars there, Jim. You're definitely uh, one of the stars of the show. That's that's for damn sure. But what what's your impression of that film? I'm sure it was a very different experience being in it, but once it was released, what's your impressions of the portrayal of you and Ron and just, just the overall film or series? Sorry. Well, I, I thought it was a little long. Uh, I have mixed feelings on it, and some parts of it were a little embarrassing, but you know, hey, you know, I was embarrassing. I didn't get embarrassed. That I knew they were filming. But the first episode where they talked to a lot of real normal guys on the street, I liked that. I could see what people were actually looking at Q for about. The rest of it got to be a little bit narratively. And the end of it, it had me looking like I was leading the insurrection. <laughs> and, and all I did was walk over to the uh, Capitol building with three million other people. Right, right, right. Do, do you think it misrepresented you at all? Or Ron? Because uh, towards... Well, I think they, they tried to infer that Ron was Q and he's not. Right. And, and the same, they, they tried to... Re- with each episode, they're inferring a different person's cue. But the reality is that nobody knows who Q is. Q is a, an anonymous person. So, what okay. happened to Q? Where did, a, where did Q go? I don't know. That is a, whoever has the password for, the, for their trip code on the website is not posted. I don't know who that person is. Do you have any suspicions on who you think Q might be? I think it might be Colin Hoback. <laughs> Being the uh, the creator of the film. He, he knows more about Q than anybody I know. <laughs> Haven't heard that theory before, but, uh, but maybe worth looking into. <laughs> Is there any? I'm, te- I'm teasing you. I'm teasing you a little bit. Of course, <laughs> I know. I don't I know. know who Q- I don't know who Cube is. I really don't. What What are your impressions on the the Q movement in general? I mean, I'm sure there's uh, one side of it that is um, concerned patriots that are, are, are very very interested uh, about the issues that we've been talking about this conversation. But there's also another very um, uh, out there um, fraction where uh, you know, it, it a lot of it comes down to, well, currently you've got a lot of uh, importance on JFK Jr. not being dead. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of different okay, kind of fractions is, that have gone from... This is... Also, this also is just a, the, the pedophile elite narrative is very central. Stuff. Um, you're combining a lot of different fractional movements into Q, but, and a lot of that stuff is uh, just other people's narratives that they're... I guess that's what I'm asking. JFK the, Jr. Thing. The, no, no one ever found JFK Jr.'s body. You know, uh, what can I say? But I don't, I don't personally believe he's... But nobody found his body. Hmm. Uh, that's not a Q uh, thing, though. Q is even mentioned to him to get I guess I'm talking about so, the culture around Q. What was actually what was actually posted on Q posts, and what the there are people out there that that have their own narrative and they tie it somewhat to the Q movement, mm. and that's entirely different than the. With Q, there's Q, and then there's Anons that are doing research, trying to find out answers to these questions you're asking me. Mm-hmm. And, and and that's important, and that's normal, and these are normal people. They're, they're regular people doing that. Whereas there's a little more eccentric factor out there with the people that are, are, are off on farther tangents away from normality. Maybe I jumped the gun with JFK uh, Jr. as that uh, seems to be embraced a lot more in recent times. Um, it's been going for a while, but but maybe but even going, by, but not by not by 
Sure, sure. sure. But what about um, the narrative about the global pedophile uh, adrenochrome elites? That seems to be very central. Were there any Q posts about that? There were Q posts about that. I guess my question is about. Oh, we've been this. What is the question? Sorry, I guess my question is more about the culture around Q, not specifically the Q drops, just more the 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 culture, the culturally, followers. Culturally, the people are full. Yeah, I, I get it. Culturally, the people that are 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 generally followed in Q are against the the uh, trafficking of children and and human trafficking in general. And, and I think that's a good side to be on. I'm, I'm, I'm on of that course. side with them. I'm against. Everyone can agree I'm on that. I'm against human trafficking too. Yep. Yep. I think everyone can agree so, on that and, for sure. And who? I think that most people will agree on that. Mm. I think that there's a certain certain section of the population that has a lot of money and and has a lot of evil thoughts that are okay with human trafficking so that they can have personal slaves and personal personal pets what have you then there's 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 some groups that are okay with human trafficking so that they can have slave labor and things like that and and i'm not okay with that and most of america is not okay with that so reality is most of america But there's an overwhelming amount of uh, you know consensus that, for example, Hillary Clinton is part of uh, you know this kind of pedophile ring elite um, and the adrenochrome narrative. Like that's not I I wouldn't have thought I could be I wrong. I don't think there's a lot of consensus on that. I okay. think that there's some truth to it, and that there's a certain amount of it that actually happened. But I don't think that there's consensus on that. Whether whether Hillary Clinton is is involved with something that is uh, not entirely above board is pretty much obvious. The amount of uh, colloquial evidence it, it tends to point that way, but there's not enough to probably put her in jail or anything like that because it doesn't the evidence doesn't exist. I mean, there's flight records but, with Clinton but if you had, but and Epstein. If you, had done, if you had done what you, she had done with the mail server, you'd be in jail right now. So I, did, I didn't hear the first part. What like was that? that? Can you repeat that? If, 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 if you had been the person that was running your government mail server out of the garage, right. you'd probably go to jail for that. Yeah, but she didn't. So why? Well, different rules for the uh, the people at the top, right? So, yeah, obviously, but that's not that's not part of the United States. You know, we have actually rules against that. Right. We have no titles of nobility in the United States. There are no lords. There are no uh, earls. There are no barons. We don't. We don't have titles in, in America. Even our president is called Mr. President. Just like you would be Mr. JR. Mm-hmm. Right. So, I mean, from my perspective, and look, I know a lot less about it. I've kept, kept a bit of an eye out of it just because I think it's interesting. But, yeah, I mean, it does seem that there has been a – a, huge, a, a very large emphasis on the kind of adrenochrome elite narrative specific to the kind of, I guess, QAnon movement. Um, do you think... But it's not, but then you, again, you, you just combined two things. You know, first of all, I don't know a lot about the adrenochrome product that they supposedly made from children's blood, which, is, which just sounds pretty gross. 
else to me. I'm not going to have that. Yeah. But if that's what that really is. But uh, QAnon is something that is manufactured by the left-wing media. The that's t- not actually the term the, and everything. The Q movement. Yeah. The term and everything. Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's a mainstream media buzzword for search engine traffic, I'm pretty sure. What's a better way to describe the movement? A better title? A better, yeah, label? What, what, what's a better label to describe these res- the Q research community? I, a lack of label would be appropriate. It's, it's uh, American small box of life. Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, really, all walks of life. From yeah, university professors I'm sure. to, to farmers and strawberry pickers and everybody in between. Do you think there's a worry that so many people are thinking this way? If, if you know, you kind of admit well, it. Well, it's, obvi- it's an obvious majority in America that's thinking. I'm talking more but, about the but, um, the wacky ideas that go along with uh, the obsessive well, nature no, of no, following the, these cues. The Q-drops. wacky ideas are the same as if you have a wacky person in Australia, and you do have wacky people in Australia. You have that Australian guy that shot up the the temples in New Zealand. I mm-hmm. mean, every every country has a weirdo like that. Right, but you know, we had that we had the Unabomber in America. I mean, yeah. Every country has weirdos. Of course, of course, but it's the, not. It's not a or the you know, Jack the Ripper in London, or, or you know who knows? You know, there's weirdos everywhere. Of course, but, but these are so, these are the these are solo yeah. people, you know. Outliers. Yeah. I'm talking. That's, that's the. That's who you're talking about for these black things. I'm talking more in terms then, of there's a community then, around these people, you know. There's a community there's not and, a community around there's not a community around the wackoness. Right. That is that is just a newspaper narrative around the wackiness. <laughs> you know, the the normal people are not doing any of that weirdo stuff. Right, right. Normal people are not running around with a suitcase full of cutlery on their way to, to kill people with cutlery. <laughs> uh, normal people are not, like, taking a rifle to a pizza joint to arrest people. Normal people aren't doing any of that. Mm. That's Those are abnormals. Those are, you have those same abnormals in Sydney or Darwin. You know, and everybody has that. There's a certain percentage of people that are broke mm-hmm. in every community, in every culture. And unfortunately, those broken people can't be identified until something happens because we don't really have a free crime unit of anything outside of uh, novels or movies. In the um in the film, you know, a big part of the kind of the structure of the film was, I guess, the uh, the the relationship or deterioration of a relationship between you and Fred. You know, now now that there's been quite a few years and Fred's kind of, you know, escaped uh, Philip Filipino jail for his cyber libel um, accusations. Do you? How do you feel about how that all went down? Do you feel bad at all for Fred? I know, I know, things got very sticky um, between you guys. He's it was still a one. He's still a one of you know. Right. Um, from what what I have heard in the narrative is that people think I'm suing him, and no, I'm not suing him. He's got criminal charges against him, and that's a that's something we'd have to bring up with prosecuting attorneys. I'm not suing. Sure, but they they came because of because of your because of your accusations, right? I I mostly don't think about them at all. I have no interest in. Do you wish the best for Fred now? Now that it's all blown over. No. No. I don't have any thoughts about him. 
Sure, no problem. Um, I'd love to ask you a bit about Ron's campaign. You know, Ron is now running for Congress in Arizona. He is. Um, how's it going? Uh, it's pretty exciting. Mm. You know, he, he went and he was talking to the um, Maricopa School District yesterday, I believe, about uh, I saw. Uh, CRT and race baiting and, and all of these different, uh, you know, communist agenda type programs that the the teachers union is trying to put into place. And he went and explained that to some of them and hopefully he reached some people up there. He's reaching many people? We don't need we certainly don't need CRT in our schools. Right. What do you, what do you, I get this kind of the CRT critical race theory talking point. And we talked about the kind of, con- it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sticky point with most Americans. My age. Yeah. We, yeah. We aren't going to accept it at all, but they're trying to teach our children this theory behind our backs. So that it, one generation grows up with it, and then we have segregation again in the United States. That is such a mistake. We've desegregated the United States two times. We, we desegregated it after the Civil War, so we had a president that uh, broke us and resegregated the United States. Then we desegregated it again. With Martin Luther King Jr. in 1965. Then, by the time, you know, I was born in 63, the dawning of a new generation, by the time I graduated high school, we had gone from Negroes and colored to black to African Americans to people of color to not even talking about it. Just Nancy and Joe and Billy and whatever. You're just whoever you are. They're taking that away, resegregating the United States now with that thing. That's not acceptable. So if maybe it's acceptable in Australia. I know you have reservations for the Aborigines and things like that. You guys have your different culture there. i but it's not acceptable in the United States. Hmm. So this is, I guess, falls into the category of and, a and communist they, push. And, and they're taking, they're taking our civil rights leaders that have already passed away before this happened, and counting them as founders of critical race theory. For example, Martin Luther King Jr. would have denounced critical race theory. It was, it's against everything he stood. for. But they count him as a founder, except he was assassinated before critical race theory was even thought of. So who's pushing? Who's pushing for this stuff in the schools? Well, it's the teachers' union, because the teachers' union is bought off by the communists. How so? How so? Hmm. That all, all the way in. In, in any community of influence in the United States, the Chinese have have bought their way in through bribery and through blackmail to having some sort of control over it. And especially in our schools, the school systems are 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 rampant with uh, communist Chinese propaganda. Right. So what what does Ron what does Ron plan to do if if elected? What is he? What's his well, kind of plan well, of attack? This is this is what he went and talked to Maricopa County about. But but Ronald's big thing right now is to get a fair shake for the people of Nevada. That not Nevada. I'm sorry. I'm in Nevada right now. Arizona. <laughs> the I'm driving in Nevada right now. Well, we're Great. like 90 miles an hour. I love it. 
Beautiful country. But, uh, yeah, it's great. It's, the uh, thing he's pushing for is during World War II, the water table in the congressional district that he's in was polluted to mine for uranium to defeat the Japanese. So, only if the federal government steps in and helps that ever get cleaned up, and he feels that there's an obligation by the federal government to do that. So, he's hoping to be able to reach out to the community leaders to, to let a accurate, because they have aerial surveys, uh, radiation surveys in the area, but they need an accurate ground survey be conducted and then communities different in different areas need to be cleaned up because otherwise they'll never be cleaned up and because the half-life of uranium 238 is like 4.5 million years that's a long time it's never gonna you know that's, there won't be humans anymore in 4.5 million years hmm. so it's never gonna get it's basically forever unless we clean it up. And it's an obligation of the federal government to do that because the, the thing about it is Ronald has a plan to clean up those areas. And there has been a lot of research because the United States is not the only place that has this problem. Egypt as well has had a problem this in the past, and they have more current research on it as well. Most of the U.S. research is like 40 years old, but we need to take what has already been researched and actually put a plan together to do the cleanup. And that cleanup is going to bring jobs to the 2nd Congressional District of Arizona. And it's also going to bring income in the course of, of uh, Recovered uranium can be sold. It's final. The, the recovering the uranium during the cleanup is is, is mineable material. The community can can raise money for the community while they clean up. Let's um hypothetically, Donald Trump gets back in, Ron gets in. What do you and what, yeah, what, what, what do you think could happen if Ron was in and then Donald Trump got back in and actually what, 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 well, what could Ron happen with the country? Ron going to be a different part of the government than, of than course. Donald Trump. Donald Trump is going to be part of the executive branch. Of course. And, and uh, Ronald is going to be in the legislative branch. They probably will never even meet each other. Right. Because he'll be in the House of Representatives, which is a lot of people. Have they so, met? You know, it's, no, not as far as I know. Mm, I know he shared a bunch of Ron's tweets, right? Uh, I think so, but we don't have a Twitter in which we Yeah. Yep. The uh, Twitter is pretty much kicked everyone I know. I guess, I guess my question is what's what's the what's the ideal outcome um, if politically speaking you could get your well, way? We, politically, if if the country can turn around from the path that's followed now, is the justice system will will be allowed to work and take those committed crimes in the last few years in the federal government and arrest them and try them and sentence them to what is appropriate for their crime. Hmm. Do you think that, that would be that would be the outcome I would like to see. Now what Ronald wants you'd have to ask him. Right, of course, of course. Do you think the whole, you know, handling of coronavirus, how do you think Donald Trump would have done it differently? Obviously <laughs> Uh, I assume he would have well, no a, emphasis on a, mandates. There's a lot of hindsight on that because when, when Donald Trump was president, we were just finding out what coronavirus was and nobody knew anything. So it was it was doing something called swag at that time. Do you 
have swag in Australia. Is that a <laughs> swag? As I I know it is more about attitude, right? <laughs> swag is called it's an acronym. Okay. For sophisticated, wild ass yes. Okay. <laughs> When, when Donald Trump was president, that's all we could do because people like Fauci were giving him different information every day. Mm. So now there's a lot more research in there. So maybe he could make a, a better decision on something. But at the time when he was president, he was playing it by ear. There's no other way anybody could do anything. We didn't, nobody knew. Right, right. What, what was the best thing to do at that time? Now we know. Now we know masks don't work. They are all they do is hurt people. Um, we know that uh, the vaccines aren't working. Most of the people that are coming down with coronavirus now have already been vaccinated. So, if those two things are not working, we're still at the same place we would have been so we might as well open the world up and just uh try not to lose what it means to be human along the way if someone gets sick you know wash your hands and practice personal hygiene that's all you can do yeah there's been a fair bit of resistance sorry you go Hmm? i'm here yeah i'm sorry i'm in a no, no, that's fine. I said there's been a bit of resistance towards, uh, you know, Donald Trump is um, prom- promoting the vaccine. Um, you know, he did Operation Warp Speed. and um, But now there's – because there's been so well, – sure, m- but, but at the time when he did that, that's the – that's based on the best information available at that time. Right. And at that time, obviously, that was the best. Who wasn't rooting for it? Everybody was because everybody wanted, you know, not to have to worry about being sick anymore. So there's a lot but of people that resist the vaccine. Out, well, at that time, nobody knew what it was. Right. And now there's a lot of people resisting the vaccine. At that time, the uh, the current uh, resident in the White House was resisting the vaccine too. Hmm. So, and, and the vice president as well, we were initially resisting it when, when Donald Trump was in office and then they embraced him and they became president and vice president. Do you think that there's a worry that um, as Donald Trump... I think, I think that the vaccine is, a, is, is just a, a financial boon for certain companies and they're paying off politicians to enforce it. That's what I think. No, and nothing more. I don't think it's a I don't think it's a kill shot. I don't think it's a I think that there are real vaccine related injuries. I think that for the most part it's uh, been nothing but a, a mild therapeutic that has stopped people from getting to the sick. Hmm. But that is uh, it's, it's not a vaccine. It's more of a another therapeutic, and it wears off. Right, right. Well, that's I mean, why yeah. they want to give it to you again and again. And what, what are the benefits to that if it doesn't uh, stop you from getting the disease? So, and, and and common sense should prevail. If this is a virus, and the the flu is a virus. And we have to get a different flu shot every year because it mutates it every year. So are you telling me that the the COVID-19 virus is not mutating? It seems to be mutating. Variant is that variant is just another name for a mutation of the virus. So every time it mutates, we need a different vaccine. We don't need the same vaccine. So why are they pushing that vaccine? to sell it because they all bought Pfizer stock. The and the politicians all have insider trading ability. 
where they can buy that stuff. And then they can force people to use that shot, whether you want it or not. And it keeps the value of that stock up so that they get lots of money. Do you think Donald That's Trump is one of those politicians that has been bought off? Because he's, he doesn't seem to be pushing that narrative. He seems to be pushing the vaccine, saying it's it's a, a marvel, everyone should get it. He's kind of, do you think, and, and do you think that will hurt him? Don, Donald Trump. Trump is not pushing a mandate for the he's vaccine. He's not pushing a mandate, no. But he's encouraging no, the vaccine. He's not. That's, and that, that is what people are angry about. It's not pushing the vaccine or not. Pushing a mandate for the vaccine is why the whole world is outraged. Yep. Mandating. That's mm-hmm. the problem. Because we don't want tyrannical government forcing us to do something we don't want to do. Yeah, yeah, yep. Jim, you've written a book. You've just come out with a book. I have. Sliced Americana. Yes, sir. Did you read it? I haven't. No. What can you tell us about it? I only just oh, okay. I only just found out about it the uh, recently. Well, it, it's a it's a science fiction novel. It includes some science and it's got some fiction in there. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a story about a. Uh, Americans that are coming together from all walks of life that are meeting together outside of our current universe with a plan to come back and save people inside of our universe. Right. Is this um like and it's and it it includes it includes a little time travel, it includes a little uh, physics. A lot of uh, personal drama, different mm-hmm. things. Uh, it's uh, dystopian is what some people described it as. But uh, I think it's more of a life about ordinary people. And nobody's perfect in this book, let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's nobody perfect in the book. But it's uh, it's got some adventure in it. It's got some excitement. It's got some tragedy and it's got some sexy parts. It's, uh, it's something. Fantastic. It sounds like a, uh, a political DMT trip. Well, it's not a lot of political stuff in it at all, actually. Okay. Okay. It's, uh, it's more of a, how, how, you, how you should live the life. And it's got a lot of, uh, talk about angelic beings okay are you a spiritual man jim i'm a christian yeah i know you've been interested in yoga for a long time uh you often do are they prayer readings or bible readings on your telegram i i i read most from the bible on my telegram right is is um are your spiritual beliefs kind of reflected in this um in your in this book at all? Well, the book has a, a lot of my personal beliefs on how people ought to be. Right, right. And but but the more reality of the book is more about what the way people really are. Hmm. People are really are just basically sinners, and they can write, thinking good, thinking bad, just being, being getting paid. And after you get paid, you're a single guy. You go off to the ditty bar. You know, that's <laughs> what guys do when they get paid. You know, and that's in the book. Yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds great. Sounds fantastic. How's it going? Is it getting out there? Uh, well, we we sold about a thousand books so far. Fantastic! Congratulations. But, uh, you know, I I'd like to see a hundred thousand sold. Mm. There's a there are some things in there that I'd like to get across to people where giving up is not one of them. Right. Don't be a quitter because. Good or bad, the people in this book are not quitters. 
Yeah. Yeah. They're certainly sinners, but they're not quitters. Yeah, okay. Good message. Um, one other thing. I've noticed that uh, Ron has kind of, uh, he's had, I, I think he's uh, linked to alienleaks.org and stuff. Um, and I'm just thinking, you know, you've got the science fiction uh, aspect to this book. This book is like a science fiction thing. Is that, um, is that kind of big in your, in your thinking, the kind of what's going on off world? Well, I think the alien leaks is more of a not a fictional thing for him. Yeah. He's uh, he's he's uh, collected a lot of uh, people sending him research on that. It's, that's about him leaking other people's research and observations. Hmm. Not a not a fix, not fictional stuff. My book is fiction. Yep. But are, are these are these obviously these are ideas that you um that you're very interested in. Are you are you on 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 board with the uh, with the kind of well, unfolding I, who, narrative? Who wouldn't, who wouldn't want to meet a space alien? I, I I definitely do. I definitely uh, would love. You know, yeah, <laughs> me too. Me too. You know, where, how to sign me up? <laughs> exactly. You know? Exactly. Uh, you know that. I, no kidding. Uh, you know, but but I never have. Hmm. Yep. But. Uh, but I do believe I've met an angel. Really? And, and that's in the book. Can... Uh, the most recent thing and personal thing about me in the book is the, is the chapter about the dog angel. That's a, that chapter is uh, true. Most Can... of the book is fictional, but that chapter is true. Can you tell us a bit about meeting an angel? Uh, I was walking my dog in Vancouver, Washington, and I had just picked him up from uh, traveling from Asia because he had to go through quarantine, and he had to go to Turkey, and it took him about a week after the quarantine to get to America with the traveling, and he showed up all beat up, and he was bloody, and he had a lot of holes in him. And I took him to the veterinarian, and, and they cleaned him up and stuff. And this lady at the hotel where I was staying at, we were walking the dog, and I turned around, and she was there. She was sitting there smoking a cigarette, just looking, and then the dog walked up to her, and she fed him, and they looked at each other, and they were, like, talking to each other, just bent over and, and, you know, that she, she told me, you know, he's been shot. And, and you need to change his food. And, and he, he likes you. And, and, you know, you're, you're, and it's, and she just was identifying with him. And that moment, that angel was just there for my dog. And he healed. And he was not immediately, not like a, not like a miraculous healing, but but he healed up right away after that, and we and I changed the food. I did everything she said, and but then we went and just walked around the hotel for a moment, to, and he took a, a bee here and there, and we came back and she was gone. But uh, it's like this, just like this lady appeared and she left, and. Those few moments were just her talking to the dog. How lovely. At that moment, my dog was the most important thing in the world at that time. Like, that's just the feeling that I had. And he, and he's just a dog. But, you know, we're all God's creatures. Right. How's the dog and, now? And you know, dog, dogs are not terribly smart, <laughs> but they have feelings, and and they're our friends. And if you only select your friends by how smart they are, you're a pretty shallow person. Right. Is the dog okay? So I, I yeah, he's okay. He's great. He's a little chubby now, like me. <laughs> <laughs> he's okay. 
Great. So did we, have, we are both going to lose some weight this year. Hey, I think, yeah, New Year's resolutions. Did meeting this angel change the course of your life or did it just reaffirm your beliefs? Well, I believe that, that our courses of our life are changing constantly. Right. If you turn left instead of right, your, your whole world changes the moment you turn left. It may be not even a recognizable change, but you have entered a new reality. Every, every moment we, we pixelate off and, and head down a different ray of reality. Yeah, yeah. Well, did it improve your life? Did it, did it change the way you conduct yourself in your life? It, it, certainly, it certainly changed his life. Yeah. He's a better dog instantly. <laughs> Yeah. Well, un- unbelievable, unbelievable stuff, Jim. Hey, Jim. Um, thank you so much for for making the time. I I really appreciate it. I'm glad we um I'm glad we got we got it to happen. Yeah, I'm, I'm super glad. And you know what? I only know you as Jr. Is that all you go by? Or are you an anonymous too? No, my name's Jack. Jack. Jack, that's right. Okay, well, Jack, it's a pleasure. It's been a pleasure, Jim. I really appreciate it. And when when, when you release this in Australia, let me know. I will. And now, as far as my book, I've, I've only been able to mail one to Australia. Okay. I had one order from Australia, and I sent it at a loss because Australia is only accepting express mail from the United States. Yeah, I think the mail is a bit of a, took, a mess. It still, took, it still took like two and a half to three weeks to get there, and I think that I don't know, but it was a bigger city in Australia. I don't remember this one now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I look forward but to reading I, it, Jim. I thought that I thought that it's quite a problem there. So I told her I told her if it continues to be that way to go ahead and mimeograph it before release in Australia. Yeah. I, so if you see a mimeograph copy of my book in Australia, I authorize that. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Well, thanks again, mate. I hope the uh, I hope you've had a beautiful drive uh, throughout the Nevada uh, countryside. Well, I just entered. I just entered California. Yep, great. I can tell the roads. The road surface changed. Yep, I did a road trip a few years ago before COVID, and uh, absolutely beautiful, beautiful landscape. It's nice. It's very well, let's, nice. Let's hope that we can. Let's hope that we can do that kind of thing again. Yeah. I would love to drive around Australia. Beautiful country. You know, and I've got friends that I've got friends there. I got some family in Melbourne. Oh, North that's where South. I am, Melbourne. Oh, well there you go. Yeah. Yep, I'm I um, have a, I have an I have an ancient old aunt that lives there. <laughs> Fantastic. She's old she's old she's old and mean. But <laughs> but she's wonderful too. Well when this is all over, uh uh let me know if you're ever in Melbourne. I will. <laughs> I will. I've, I've never been to Australia but I wanna go. Great country. <laughs> all right, thank you, Jim. Much appreciated. Okay, bye bye. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Thanks everyone. Uh...